for something a little different. I'm going to preface this with um, I'm Hannah Wirtschafter. I work at Northwestern with Dr. Sarah Sola and John Disterhoff. Um, Sarah was supposed to be the one here giving the talk today, and she couldn't make it. So uh, I found out Monday night that I was coming and put the presentation together Tuesday morning. So it is extremely preliminary, and I welcome any and all feedback uh, if it's gentle. So. <laughs> So something I'm really interested in is how do learning and memory interact with context within the hippocampus? So we all know that there's a school of thought that the hippocampus is for memory, like you take HM, you can't remember anything anymore. And then how does that fit with the idea that the hippocampus is for space and navigation? I did my PhD here with Matt, so obviously that view is really near and dear to me, but I'm really interested in how these two views fit together. And I think a really interesting way to look at that is by looking at learning generalization and how when you learn something in one context, you're able to transfer that to another context. And how is that represented in the hippocampus, which represents, represents learning and the context. So in looking at this, I'm looking at a behavior called trace Ivlin conditioning, which is a hippocampus dependent associative conditioning task. So animals without a hippocampus can't do this. And what it is, is there you have a condition, condition stimulus, which in this case is a tone, and then a 500 millisecond trace period. And that trace period is essential. It's what makes a uh, task hippo hippocampally dependent. Without the trace period, actually, animals without a hippocampus can do it. And then you have your US, um, which is a shock to the eyelid. And at the beginning of training, animals only will blink to the shock. But then as they are trained on this task, the, their condition response uh, develops and they start blinking earlier, so after the tone and before the shock. And this task is also interested, interesting because it's represented in the hippocampus. Um, these are uh, from six different sessions here, um, the population level activity of the cells. And you can see that you get different activity um, when the tone and when the shock are presented. So something that I find really interesting about this task is obviously the animals in the environment. I do it in freely moving animals, which is kind of unique. So they're running around. They have place fields. It takes them about two weeks to learn a task with a 500 millisecond trace period. But then you can transfer them to a different environment. So in this case, the first environment is this rectangle, and the second one is this oval. Um, I can track the, cell, the same cells from one environment to another, and I see that the cells have different place fields. But the animals really quickly are able to maintain their condition response in the new environment. So they have maybe three trials, three to five trials in the new environment where they don't respond, and then they redevelop their condition response. So this can happen again in three to five trials. Well, in the original environment, it can take two weeks. So the big question that I'm interested in is how does this representation of this conditioned eye blink task, uh, how is it maintained against this backdrop of remapping place cells? And the tool that I used to do to look at this is calcium imaging. Um, so I use the uh, open source, yay, a mini scope from UCLA. And using that, I record from, say, one of rat hippocampus. Um, and then I try to hold the cells throughout all of the training on the eye blink conditioning and um, in the two different environments. And so this is just an example of a day which had about 950 cells. And um, one day is on the left, and then six days later is on the right. And you can see the same colors represent the same cells. And I did this with, uh, I did this post processing using Cheetah, which is another open source analysis package. So the data that I'm going to show you today is um, from a task where I took an animal. He has one day in environment A, which is the rectangle. Um, he just explores, there's no conditioning in environment A on the, his first day. Um, then he is trained in, in environment A with the tone and the shock. And I train him until he's able to reach over 70% in three consecutive days. And we're going to be looking at the, in the data I'm presenting, we're mostly going to be looking at the last day. So I'm going to call that day AN. Then he gets switched to environment B, where again he has a day of exploration, so it's not a novel environment. And then he gets tested for two days in uh, environment B. And I'm going to call that we're going to be looking at the first day of that, which is B1. So I'm really looking at day AN, so the last day in environment A, day B1, the first day in environment B. Let's skip the two days back in environment A. <laughs> so as I said before, uh, the big question that I'm interested in is how are representations of this conditioning related stimuli and the learning of the task 
maintained against the background of remap place cells? And I think this is a really interesting question that should probably be tackled at the population level. So the thought, the hypothesis that I had originally going into this experiment was, do you have some type of higher order manifold representation of place which changes as the animal goes between environments, while you have a different kind of higher order uh, uh, neural representation of the task that stays the same? So this is what I looked at, and I tried to tackle it, or I'm in the process, again, very preliminary, of tackling this question from a bunch of different angles. Um, and we're very privileged to be here right now where three out of these four techniques, um, people who develop them are either in the room or in the building, Pearson being the exception, rest in peace. Um, so I'm going to just talk about, <laughs> I'm just going to talk about um, the different uh, models that I used and what I got out of them, and feel free to tell me I am wrong. Again, gently. Okay, so the first thing that I used was Zebra, which we had a really nice overview of this morning. Um, so as Mackenzie said, it's a new encoding method designed to jointly leverage behavioral and neural, neural data, and something that's really nice about it is that you can use label data or unlabeled data. And I really started with this method to kind of look in and see what the overall structure of my data was and what kind of the number of hidden states uh, were required to really look at uh, what was happening within my data. So um, all of this is using label data. And so on the left, um, I fed in all the non-conditioning periods from day AN and day B1. And you can see with only two hidden units and two output dimensions, Zebra does a really nice um, job of dividing the neural data into session, the session in A and the session in B. Um, and we hope that's true because, again, you have play cells that are totally remapped between the two environments. Uh, so then I wanted to see if it was able to differentiate the uh, CS period and the US period within the two environments. And again, it actually only takes two hidden units to be able to say this conditioning happened in environment A and this conditioning happened in environment B. But then you really have to increase the number of hidden units to be able to separate out the CS period from the US period. So there are a lot of numbers between 2 and 20 and 20 and 100. But you can see by the time you're getting to a ton of hidden units, you kind of have these traces of CS followed by US or US followed by CS. Um, kind of making a path, but even with 20 hidden units, you kind of see clustering of the CS and US periods. So uh, using this result, kind of then went backwards, I guess, to a linear method of PCA, and I just wanted to see how, if PCA could capture kind of the same things that Zebra was, um, with Zebra needed 20 hidden states, would PCA be able to capture it with 20 principal components. Um, I'm sure you all know what PCA is, but just in case, um, it's another method to reduce the dimensionality of data while retaining as much variability as possible. Um, obviously, it's a linear technique, um, and there hasn't been much success using it, or any su success really using it in the hippocampus, though we have seen uh, linear methods be really successful in areas like the motor cortex. Um, and something, of course, to keep in mind with PCA is that uh, the, the principal components that are extracted may not actually correlate with any obvious dimensionality of the data or behavior. OK, so I did a few things with um, PCA. So first, I looked at environment A and environment B separately. And you can see kind of the shapes in the first three principal components are very similar. Um, but then when you concatenate environment A and B together, uh, even though they are in overlapping spaces, when you do look at the first five principal components, you can see, again, PCA has a really easy time distinguishing uh, between environment one and, or environment A and environment B in early principal components. And um, I'm not showing it here, but within about 15 to 20 principal components, you do account for about 95% of the variance, which is uh, consistent with previous studies uh, in hippocampal data. Um, so then I also looked at only the conditioning periods in environment A, and, um, day A, N, and day B, 1. And the, each 
little streak here is an individual trial, and then these are averaged down below. Um, so they look like maybe the CS and US inhabit different spaces, maybe day A and B1 inhabit different spaces, but the thing is it's really unclear whether the principal components stand for the same thing in the two environments. So it's hard to compare just looking at um, one day, day against one day like it is here. Um, so then I used a different type of analysis called principal angles, which actually takes your PCA data and it rotates it all to align um, all your data as best as possible so you can see if the PCA spaces that the data is inhabiting are actually similar. And this was an extremely surprising result to me because I thought that maybe the encoding of space would occur all in the same kind of neural manifold but moving around different spaces of it and that the task would be represented in a different manifold. But um, I'll note that these graphs also include day A and minus one and day B2. And when I look at this data, it actually looks like every single manifold is the same manifold. So day A n minus one is not more similar to day A n than it is to day B one or to B two, and then um, and that's true for the non-trial times and the trial times, and they also aren't really that much more different than looking within day at um, non-trial times versus trial times. So this was really surprising to me that both the location and the task seem to be on the same manifold, just potentially in different spaces. So then I moved to a new method. Um, so then I went to isomap, um, which is another nonlinear method, um, which really tries to maintain the dimensionality of the data. Um, probably most of you are familiar with this, but the classic example is like a Swiss roll, where two points might look really close to each other because they're close to each other on a spiral, but if you actually just look at the distances, you wouldn't recapitulate the Swiss roll um, correctly. So um, this is probably the least informative method for my data because the isomap results just kind of ended up looking like nothing. Um, what was interesting is that I needed very few neural modes to get a really small residual variance, so way fewer than PCA but it's completely, at least to me, um, non-interpretable. Uh, there were no obvious connections between different parts of the graphs. Uh, different days didn't look more similar than other days. Um, again, I couldn't really relate the embedding shape to anything that was actually happening with the animal or the behavior or the neural data. Okay, I've got two minutes left. So <laughs> lastly, um, oh, I have five minutes? Okay, I'll go slower. So. Then I decided to use MIND, um, which is, uh, came out of the tank lab and they used to look at a task where an animal was running in a VR environment and passing a different number of landmarks. Um, and this method is unique in that uh, ISOMAP and PCA both take, don't take into account any uh, part of the temporal structure of the data or the order, ordering of the data points. And as we all know, the hippocampus is really sequence oriented. So I thought that this technique might give me some insight into the sequence, especially because um, going from a CS to US is also the sequence of, of those events is really important. Um, you don't develop, you, you couldn't do a task where you go from a US to a CS. Um, so with MIND, I looked again at environment AN and environment B1, and I forgot to say this at the beginning, but Every single day, when I'm looking at A, N, and B1, I'm only looking at cells that reoccurred in those two days. So it's a subpopulation of the entire cells that recorded. So I'm really comparing like to like. And so you can see in the top row, um, this is uh, animal. Uh, this is the data with no trials included. So just a mapping of the environment, um, and the colors here just represent uh, going through space. So the dark blue is early and in the trial and the yellow is late. Um, and so you can see A, N, and then when I concatenate A, N, and B, one together, again, you get a really nice separation of the two environments in this neural space. Um, but then I decide to look at just the trial times and to see what that would look like. And for A, N, and B, one, I kind of got these weird lines. And then when I concatenated them together, there wasn't actually a clear separation between 
AN and B1, and the data actually looks the same when you're looking from AN minus a n minus one to a n and b one to b two. So there isn't a super clear separation like there is in the actual spatial data. The caveat of this is that MIND is really built for a huge amount of time data and the trials are relatively short. Um, and so only a little bit of tweaking with the parameters around the times of the conditioning task uh, gives me this just mess that's in the corner. So these are really non-stable um, representations of the task. Um, so what I'm really looking for now is something that can uh, kind of evaluate the task and uh, with the lower amount of data and lower amount of resolution. So the things that I hope to look at next are um, temporal isomap and temporal te PCA, because again, both of the techniques don't take, in count, it take into account the ordering of the task or uh, the ordering of what the animal does in the environment. Um, and also tensor component analysis, which actually adds a third dimensionality to the data. So not only do you have time, but you can kind of stack your trials um, back to back. And obviously, I also want to look at this data uh, during the learning of the task also, which I haven't even touched yet. And then lastly, uh, in the spirit of the conference, um, when I started this project as someone kind of new to these techniques, um, there were just a lot out there. Um, and as the number of methods increases, it's becoming more and more difficult to discern what method is appropriate for what kind of data you have and what kind of task you have. And I think it's really important to note that um, the task of discerning your method, what method you should use, becomes more and more burdensome and computationally intense as the size of your data set grows. Um, like I had to get on the Northwestern supercomputers to be able to run MIND on the entirety of my data set. So um, everyone figuring out for themselves whether MIND works or not is maybe not like the most practical thing computationally. Okay, so lastly, just a thank you um, to Sarah, even though she definitely threw me to the wolves in front of you guys today. Um, I say that with all due respect, I really love her. Um, John Disterhoff, a MAD training grant which supported some of this work, and I was just awarded a Brain Initiative, K99R00, and I will be on the job market, so if you were remotely impressed. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter or Blue Sky. So, yeah, we'll take questions. Yeah. Really short question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, honestly, I just wanted to see what it looked like at first. It was exploratory. Yeah. Um, I think it's really discerning what method is appropriate for what kind of data you're looking at. So even from like this is temporal data, I need to use a method that takes into account temporal information. Um, so that kind of larger question to this method isn't appropriate for really short time periods that have relative data scarcity. So both logistic questions and more conceptual questions about the methods. I have a question. Yeah. Um, we threw some shade on Isomap, but I know Isomap did quite an outstanding job to expand like 90% of variants with five variables. Yeah. Is um, quite fantastic. Oh, yeah. So I was really surprised by that, but how much does it matter if we have no idea what it means? <laughs> it's it's cross-validated, right? So Isomap discovered something that is in your data and explains so yeah, much, yeah. Hard, even though it doesn't really lend itself to human understanding. Exactly. Right? So um, what then? I, I, that's a serious question. I'm not making fun of you. Um, like, I'm not sure what kind of to do with that then. Yeah, I think what 